welcome to the Aftershock. We've got a special edition for you. Much demand, very hyped. Uh, it hasn't been a game. We all know there's not going to be a game for a little while, but we did have a signing uh, right at the transfer deadline announced the day after. And uh, interestingly, we saw a reaction from Alex Morgan on Twitter about his level of excitement about it. Some people pulled up Jamin Moore's old tweets about this subject, uh, kind of gesturing in the opposite direction. We thought that we absolutely had to have a debate show for you. Uh, so I'm here to moderate slash judge this debate. Uh, it's my pleasure to do so. Uh, I will just briefly introduce the inter the transaction itself, uh, and then I'm going to hand it over to these two to give you kind of more depth of, uh, of understanding of it. Basically, what we have is we have Matthew Hoppy. Uh, he's 22-year-old. He's from Southern California. He was actually part of the LA Galaxy Academy. And depending on what source you read, it says that he was released by the Academy when he was 15 years old, uh, but went to Barca residency, made his professional debut with Schalke, had an amazing kind of debut season at 19 years old for those Bundesliga team. Uh, and then he got a total of eight caps with the U.S. national team, including two this year, actually. So they're recent. Uh, and he got a goal in the Gold Cup 2021. He's had kind of an erratic last couple of years. And uh, but in what basically the Quakes are doing is they're bringing him in on a loan. Uh, we had a couple of details from the original release weren't actually there. Uh, we were furiously texting the club about them. They've corrected the release. So now we know for sure that it's a half season loan. So it's a six month loan to the end of 2023. There is an option to purchase permanently at the end of that. So it's basically an extended trial. And he's going to be part of the U22 program. Uh, that's really important for uh, the roster management because it means that his cap hit for the half year is $75,000, which is a very small number for the cap. Uh, anyway, those are the basic details. I'm going to hand it over to these two. Jamin on my left, Alex Morgan on the right. You're on opposite sides of this question. Uh, I'm actually going to go to Alex first because I think that uh, your level of excitement is probably the best place to start it. You know, th there are some things that are to get excited about here. There's some things pretty concerned about. But give me the kind of the, uh, the perspective of what had you excited when you first saw this come across our, your timeline unexpectedly, right? This is not something that we had heard that was imminent, uh, although we have been talking about him for a while. Colin, this is the highest profile signing that the San Jose Earthquakes have ever made. That in itself is reason to be excited. And the structure of this deal is good. The player is good. The history is good. Uh, I think that this is probably the biggest signing on all those fronts that the San Jose Earthquakes have ever made. This is the signing that San Jose Earthquakes fans have been waiting for. Uh, this is a player who can come in and catalyze this offense and dramatically change uh, the direction that the team is heading this season, provide immediate improvement uh, on the field uh, and bring fans to the stadium and motivate fans and get fans excited. I think it is a win on every one of those fronts. And I, I don't I don't see how you could con have any complaints about about this deal. I think Chris Leach has covered all of his bases with this one uh, and deserves credit for kind of miraculously pulling this out of nowhere. All right, Jamin. Just to well, an opening summary. We got to obviously we have a opening couple summary. of places to, to opening dive summary. deeper in, but just for the opening here. I think what Alex is saying is, you know, this is the signing that maybe people don't have to go to Google and look up. I think someone might have mentioned that in, in Slack. Like it's one or, or actually Robert Jonas, our own Robert Jonas mentioned that. Like it's like, yay, a player that we don't have to look up to know who it is. And I, I, I think like, from that perspective, I agree with Alex. From every other perspective, I disagree with Alex. So we're going to have plenty of time to be able to talk about it. The fans are lining up on different sides. They're calling it a cage match. They want the fight to begin. They're picking their sides. I get it. Look, what's nice is that there's something to discuss, something to be excited about. And if that was what Chris Leach was going for, was some impact to get the fan base talking, he did the right move. If it is, change the team on the field and get a better result and give us something that we're not currently getting in a couple of the key positions of the team. Striker, winger, a 10, could have been a backup six or anything like that. I don't think that this does it. I think this is on the par with the Io Akinola signing. So with that, so then, oh, and by the Io Akinola signing, it, by the way, let's take a moment to reflect here because we are all people who've been following this club for a long time, you know, I was going to games in the 90s when they were still the clash. Having two young, these are 22-year-olds who have national team caps, actually for the United States. I can all eventually decided to play for Canada, but he has a USMNT cap and a goal. Those two guys 
being seen as kind of like depth signings and like, oh, I don't really know to be excited about them. That is a wild departure from what it used to be the norm in San Jose five to 10 years ago. So this is excitement level. It, you know, I think that people perhaps don't appreciate how far that they have come. So I think we Con. can all agree that the excitement level is at a different level. I'm sorry, who said Matthew Hoppy was a depth signing? That's not my expectation. My expectation is not that he starts on the bench and he is getting in as a sub every now and then. My expectation that he is a guy who realistically will be challenging for a starting spot, whether it's that number nine spot, whether it's a left wing spot, uh, or, or whether it's a new position that, that Luchi Gonzalez creates from day one. That's the way I see this signing. Interesting. All right, so so uh, we have a relative uh, relative consensus around it. it is an exciting signing as somebody that people know. He's a U.S. national team pedigree. He came from the Bundesliga at a very young age. You know, it's kind of got some excitement there. Let's talk strictly then, uh, w- before getting to the terms of the transaction, let's just talk about the player himself. And we'll start with you, Alex, on this. Is, you know, why is it you're so confident that he could potentially displace uh, a Jabo, he could potentially displace a Cade Cowell slash the other options they've tried on the left wing, you know, uh, or if there's any other role you had in mind for him, what attributes does he bring that are an upgrade on their current starting positions? Look, he's a number nine who can run in behind and finish in the box. If you look at his highlight reel, a lot of his goals are very similar. He's making a diagonal run, ghosting in behind the defender and putting a nice finish in the back of the net. And he's very good at that. He did that. I think six goals for Schalke in like the space of half of a season, three goals in one game, first American to score a hat trick in the Bundesliga. He did it at the highest level. He can do that against Bundesliga defenders. He can do that against national team defenders. He went to the U S men's national team camp that with the a team, the first team at the U S men's national team, he was training with guys like Christian Pulisic, uh, you know, Gio Reyna and, And he was chosen to start in that position. And he scored key goals in the Gold Cup doing that. We know he can do it at the highest level. We don't know if he has the consistency to do it at the highest level. Maybe he's no longer a guy who you want to measure against Florian Balogun or some of those other national team guys. But I'm confident with the success that he has in the Bundesliga that he can come and do that in San Jose. And then he can give the Quakes another really solid option up top. And we know that they've been struggling for ideas centrally that they haven't had a a lot of goals coming straight down the middle of the pitch and he is the kind of guy who can bring those goals from the middle of the pitch who can make them dangerous on the counter attack who can give them another look that will imbalance uh, opponents and make the quakes much much more difficult to defend against so jamin again we're before we get to the terms of the transaction just about the player you have been openly uh, relatively skeptical about uh, his his fit on the team. I will say privately, I'm the I'm the moderator. I've also harbored some skepticism about his game. Uh, you know, what what are the limitations of his game that make you think he's not necessarily an upgrade on the existing starting lineup? So I just want to say before we get too far going here, booms. Uh, yeah, dig it. That's a little Macho Man reference there. Okay. So uh, the uh, around around Matthew Hoppy, I think the issue is that what Alex has said has already vindicated what I've said, which is that his goals look kind of the same. He's 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 got to like arrive in the box, be in the right place at the right time. I mean, his his one goal that uh, got shared today by by Asher uh, that he's gotten in the Scottish League was basically the ball went off someone's head, fell at his feet and he kicked it in the goal. Not exactly impressive. I mean, he has one goal in the last 20 or so professional games. Um, So if you just look at the basic data, he's nowhere close even to Cade Cowell. So I guess it depends. Is he coming in as a winger? Is he coming in as a nine? Is he coming in as a nine? I don't expect him to displace Jeremy Abobasi. I don't. I know some people might like to see that right now. I don't. I think some people are very skeptical on what Jeremy Abobasi is bringing. And I know some people in the chat are, but I don't think that he brings better attributes than any player that is currently starting for the San Jose Earthquakes. What he brings is if you get up a goal, put him on and help you time waste and CONCACAF the game up and, you know, kick the ball further out of bounds and jump, you know, wave your hands in front of the guy as he's trying to throw the ball in, like, you know, that's that's great if you're playing in the Gold Cup and you're trying to protect a lead. It's not not so great if you're the San Jose Earthquakes and you're behind in a game and you're trying to get a goal. 
So I just don't feel like, you know, the, 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 the data points and I can, I can bring them up. Like I can just make this a data data argument because there is not one point that he is superior to Cade Cowell on. Just not one. He, he doesn't score on a more frequent rate. Doesn't get more XG. Doesn't get more XA. Doesn't get more progressive passes. Doesn't get more progressive dribbles. Any offensive stat that you want to look at, he is not better than Cade Cowell. He is not better than Jeremy Obogacy. He is definitely not better than Christian Espinosa, and he's not better than anyone else in the middle. So who is he displacing? I don't see what he's going to add that bringing in Io Akinola already didn't add um, you know, into this team. I feel like he's now duplicative for what you got in Io. That's, Jamin brings up a really important point that I had the exact same question, Alex, is I can understand the importance of adding a, a running in behind, you know, in the box goal scorer, but they just got one. You know, what, what does he add that Io Akinola doesn't add? I, I, I think that uh, that's an open question. And, and I, I don't have the answer yet. And I think we need to see multiple games from them to understand the difference between them. I think that Io Akinola provides more aerial ability. I think that, uh, you know, he, he's not as fast as Matthew Hoppy is anymore since he had the ACL injury. So I think that Matthew Hoppy is definitely a, a more of a runner in behind, and I don't really see Io Akinola playing that role anymore. Right. I see the way Io playing as being much more centered in the box. So I think they're different players, but I my hope is that they will complement each other and they will give San Jose multiple looks going forward. And I don't think it's a bad thing for the Earthquakes to have multiple options up top, given the fundamental issue with this team this season has been a lack of goal scorers in the team. They've had two goal scorers in the team, Jeremy Obobese and Christian Espinosa. Bringing in two more goal scorers gets them to four. That is like bare minimum. They're just covering the gaps that they have right now. And to have two guys who can come in and add goals is good. Even if their qualities are overlapping somewhat, I think that to have guys uh, who can come in and you know take – shoulder responsibility at different points in this season is important for this team. Yeah. It, so I want to uh, clarify two things uh, before we turn it over. So one thing is that I have talked to some of the front office and you saw the way that he was used with the men's national team as well is that he, they definitely see him uh, hoppy playing on left wing as an option. Like that, that is absolutely something that they perceive as, as a potential role for him. So he's not viewed as not as strict number nine. Um, his skill set to me is more similar to Benji Kikanovic as a left winger. Um, but the problem is, and this is the other thing I want to clarify is I don't think Matthew Hobby is very fast. And actually I think that Kikanovic is demonstrably faster. And Jamin, if I recall correctly, yes. we've had, we actually have some data on that fact where we have some evidence on that fact. Yeah, no, no, it's definitely Benji's faster. And, and look, I've actually talked to people who've had them side by side in camps before. And Benji is the superior player of the two at least as of their college days. Now, maybe it's different now. And we, I think we should all allow, look, you know, hey, I'm look, I'm rooting for the guy. I hope he's great. I think he, I hope he comes in and bangs in four or five goals. I just look at his data and go like, I don't see how, right? Yeah. You know, he, well, he, he had that stretch in the Bundesliga that was just magic. And since then, it's been like the complete opposite. It's the absence of magic. Like it hasn't been there. So Whatever happened in, in, you know, from a Bundesliga side, like if that's not the way the Quakes are playing, I don't see how he gets into the positions to be able to put in those types of goals. Alex in the chat today is talking about putting in four or five goals or getting two or three assists. Like he's never done that in his career. You know, like, why are we expecting him to start Jimmy. doing that all of a sudden now? Are you saying like MLS is that much inferior to the Scottish League, Alex? Because he's not doing that in the Scottish League. Last I checked, MLS better league than the Scottish League. Jamin, I think you, there, there, there's an apple to oranges comparison here. His XG with Schalke, his XG with Mallorca is not comparable to the XG that Cade Cowell and Benji Gakanovic are doing in MLS. I'm sorry, defenses are better. They're more organized. Players are faster. Jamin's players point, are better that's surely not true of Hibs. Two weeks. That's not true of Hibs. And I don't know what happened at Hibs. And that is a reason maybe to, uh, to withhold some of the, 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 the excitement here. That's, that's a red flag, but he's still only 22 years old and he's shown so much promise at the highest level that I'm willing to, uh, to take the chance on him. And 
even if it's just a flyer, even if that's that's how Chris Leach sees this transfer as a six month loan to see what happens. I think that's a fantastic move to make for this team at this point. We're not saying that he's going to be Christian Espinosa, that he's going to be the player that the earthquakes want to build around for the next three years and will consistently bring 15 goals and, you know, five, 10 assists to this team every season. That's not what this kind of transfer is. And trying to benchmark him against that, I think is, is not really a, a useful thing to do. I, 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 the way I see this transfer is injecting energy, uh, motivation for this team at this stage in the season and to change the narrative about this team. And I think this transfer profoundly succeeds in that. And I think it also, the key here is that, you know, saying, is he going to be faster than Cade Cowell on the left wing? Is he going to take players on in the way Cade Cowell does? No, but he's not the same kind of player. And the reason I'm excited is because I think that this allows the Quakes to play with two at the top, which worked really, really well uh, in the brief moments that we saw of it against Tigres. The Quakes now have two number nines who can play alongside Jeremy Obobese, uh, with two players at the top, and that allows them to press teams in a different way, and that worked well against Tigres. That allows them to play on the counterattack in a different way and to have players posted up top and run in behind in a different way. Uh, and I think that Matthew Hoppy can succeed in that role, and I think that that role can potentially uh, make Cade Cowell and Benji Kikanovich better because it changes the shape of the team. It changes the things that they're asking of those players uh, and hopefully a way that will get more out of them right now, because they're not getting enough out of Cade Cowell right now. They're not getting enough out of Benji Kukanovic right now. Even if Matthew Hoppy isn't going to uh, take their spot at left wing, he will change the shape of this team in a way that hopefully will get more out of those two players. And that's how I think you get an upgrade on, on you know, the current roster as is. Look, I want to, I want to also, I want to also kind of point out that, you know, there was there was a lot of people who would have looked at if 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 this was if this was 2011, 2012, and Stephen Lenhart had done what he had done before coming into the earthquakes, and you had said, you know, what are we getting with the Stephen Lenhart guy? Everyone being like, well, he's a bit of a clown. He likes to to you know kind of instigate things on the pitch and doesn't really score that many goals, and then. 2012 happens. He got into the right group with the right people. All of a sudden, right, with if it's not for a Steven Lenhart, the 2012 team is not what they are. They're going to draw a bunch of games. They're going to lose a bunch of one-goal games because you don't have somebody to put that head and get that ball in the box and get kind of nasty and after stuff. I think the upside, if I'm going to look at what a positive of what I think a Matthew Hoppy can bring, that positive is I can see him getting into the nastiness in the box when you got to hoof a bunch of balls in the box and you got to find a way to get a ball into the goal of just like staying in there and, you know, uh, and trying to, to be able to get that. The problem is for me, MLS has gone beyond what worked in 2012. The, the defending is much better than it was. You can't just hoof a bunch of crosses in the box and, and hope that you got, you know, a, a Stephen Lenhart and a Chris Wondolowski and an Alan Gordon to find find those balls magically. It just doesn't happen the same way anymore. Um, it's a, it's just a much better league that plays much less direct. And by the way, the pitches are much bigger than they were, you know, back at Buckshaw. So, you know, there's just more space to be able to, to deal with things like that. I just, for me, like, I, I, I like a vibes guy. I'm not sure I like a vibes guy for this team for what they need right now, given their deficiencies. So if I can jump back in here, the uh, as we're kind of like assessing this conversation, uh, one thing I just want to get out there because I've seen some people in the comments, you know, taking the, the Lenny comparison there is perhaps more literal than you meant it. Um, the, Hoppy as a body type and as a stylistic player, he's more of an in the box finisher. And I won't say Chris Wondolowski because that's not a comparison we'll ever put anyone uh, to when they come here. But if you guys remember Danny Masovsky from the uh, Reno USL team, you know, that type of poacher type finisher. But his body type and style is quite a bit like Benji Kikanovich. He's you know, probably about six foot two, relatively lean. He's not necessarily a great leaper and he's not particularly strong. So he's not like a big, you know, Stephen Lenhart bruiser in the box. Uh, he's a bit, of, he's a taller finisher. 
Uh, and he's got some pace, but I don't think I would describe it as blazing. It's you know probably a step slow to Benji. Now, to be clear, what I'm saying here is comparing him to Benji of last season, I would view him as a slower Benji. What Benji's currently producing, you know, it, he certainly has you know the ability to do more than that. The other really important part of this conversation, though, which I have not touched on yet, is about the resources involved. Uh, and I, Jamin, I kind of actually want to direct this back to you, because when your original relatively negative comments about signing Hoppy were in an environment where we were thinking about or competing with a transfer permanent bid of a $3 million bid uh, to bring him in permanently and take on a long-term commitment. This right. $75,000 on cap. I believe the off cap or like the out of pocket rate for John Fisher is probably like 250 grand. And in six months time, you have an option to buy, which we don't know exactly what the number is, but presumably it's not particularly high given how uh, difficult his last couple of years have been. So what is that, the difference in terms of the transfer cost to make it, how does that cause you to evaluate it differently? Is it flipped it to a positive given how little it costs or is it, you know, are you still kind of lukewarm about it? Well, for me, it's more about could we have filled a a need that was stronger than what Hoppy is going to fill with that same money? And if the answer is it was not possible, you are not going to be able to get a different winger profile, a starting winger, a ten, um, you know, or or a backup six, you know, as of right now, then I guess like because you have the money, you have to spend it. You know, if you don't, you lose it type thing. You know, you know, I, I guess like, is it worth a flyer? Maybe. Um, but uh, for me, there just was a lot more places that there are needs in this team. In fact, needs that Alex has gone on and on about for week and Hoppy or for weeks and Hoppy feels none of them. Well, so, yeah, just to be fair, Jim, and if you're talking literally the last day of the transfer window for somebody who slips into the 22 program and only counts 75,000 against your budget and you're only committed to him for six months, I don't think there's a lot of options there. They're going to make your first team better. Probably. Maybe not. Maybe not. Um, you know, uh, look, there, there, there have been, there is, there are still ways to be able to get certain things done. And I think we're going to go through those, but you know, this is someone who the quakes, allegedly had on their discovery list a while back. And you're right, Colin, like we were talking before we were talking like a pretty expensive deal. You're talking like Grezzo type numbers to be able to bring them in before. And I think like initially my reaction was largely couched in the fact that that much money for someone that I feel is very unproven, right? Now, if you come back and go like, well, he's 21, um, you're effectively getting him for the price of somebody who is on the, uh, the, the secondary you know, part of the roster, not, not the senior roster, but, you know, somebody who's in the supplemental roster type area. Um, and it's more or less a flyer. It's a six month trial. Like, is it bad money? No, but again, like I'm still trying to figure out what unique thing that he brings. If you went through the trouble to go get Iowa Canola and get him into the U22 program, you know, out of Toronto and you gave up, you know, some, some, uh, some, some gam to be able to do that in the form of a of a, uh, a, 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 a international slot. I'm trying to just go like, what was the upside, particularly to Hoppy, that you already didn't get out of IO? And now it feels like, did you overspend for IO? Um, if you were going to be able to get Hoppy for that for that particular price, because I well, if I if I, I may, the, the international what the, slot what is the a half season is. international slot, and they had three left. Uh, to to go and they weren't going to be able to sell all three, so I really think it's right. a pretty right. minor cost. Uh, Again, if you have that international money. slot, you might be able to trade it. You might be able to use it in some other way. Maybe you can sell another. But they one still have two more, more and they game. weren't able to move either of them. So you know, I, I think that the that they still use an international is, slot. They, we we don't know because you know they 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 could. They could still. My point is that it is not the same as you know at the beginning of the season when international slots are trading hands. They trade hands for two hundred fifty thousand, you know, gam. In the middle right. of the season, they're trading hands for one hundred fifty thousand. And by the very end of the transfer window, when you're holding on to a couple assets and there's you know the the merry or whatever the the merry grounds about to stop, you know, it's a it's a relatively minor asset to give up. Anyway, I'm sorry if if I may, I want to redirect this back to Alex. Now that we've kind of moved to the discussion of the terms of the deal, why, you know, obviously you like the player, you like his potential upside, but, you know, I'm assuming the terms are part of why he got so excited about it. 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I think we need to do like a hard reset here because I think the structure in terms of this deal is like miraculous. And the signing that Chris Leach has been able to produce with essentially no cap hit and no long-term risk is a, like incredible, right? He He's making what? 75K against the cap hit, something like that on a, a U22 initiative contract. That's basically nothing against the roster cap. And they're getting an incredibly promising player with top level experience, right? Tommy Thompson is counting for like three times as much against the, 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 the salary cap. Players who are never going to see the starting lineup are counting, you know, multiple times that, that Matthew Hoppy will against the salary cap. Your backup goalkeeper, JT Marcinkowski, is counting, you know, four or five times that amount against the salary cap. This is an incredible deal. There's no long-term risk because it's only a six-month loan. And uh, the Quakes have the option to buy him if he turns out uh, to, to score, you know, four or five goals. And, and they think that they want to uh, take that uh, take that long-term contract on. And, and if they do, then he's a guy who they could realistically sell for even more back to Europe. So I think that the structure of this deal is fantastic. I don't think there's any way in the world you could have signed a better player with these resources. The only way that Chris Leach could have brought in a better player is if he'd moved someone out. If he'd moved Cade Cowell out to Europe for a seven-figure sum, if he'd moved Benji Kukanovich in an interleague trade, if he'd moved Jameer Montero, the only way they could have done that is some sort of swap. I was not expecting them to be able to add another piece to this team. That's what, when we talked to Chris Leach last, he was like, yeah, we don't have a lot of room. We're essentially looking at a swap at this point. That fact that they added another player to this team and retained Benji Kukanovich and retained Cade Cowell and retained Jameer Montero is really quite miraculous to me. And I, I think it's a fantastic bit of business by Chris Leach. Whatever you think of Matthew Hoppe's ceiling, of his potential, of the specific attribute which he's going to bring to the team, which I still think are good. And I think you guys are underestimating how much skill it takes to time those runs in behind and to finish in the box. I mean, for for goodness sake, we've watched Kate Cowell miss like a hundred one-on-one chances in the past, you know, few seasons. Those are the kind of chances that Matthew Hoppy will put in the back of the net consistently because he's done it at the highest level against the best goalkeepers in the world, against the best defenders in the world. So I, I think you're underestimating his attributes and what he can bring to this team. And I think you're not giving Chris Leach enough credit for getting this done on a fantastic uh, a contract. Yeah, so I, I very much agree with that. I want to just add a, a couple other things. Is Of course, Lucha Gonzalez was a member of the U.S. national team uh, coaching staff. Uh, and during that time, I actually don't think any of Hoppy's caps came while Lucha was on the staff. However, he was called up to the camp right after the World Cup. Surely he was a guy that that staff was following really closely, watching his tape, you know, keeping track of him. This is somebody that, you know, Lucci has familiarity with. Uh, and Ayo Akinola to a certain extent as well, you know, somebody that they surely would have been familiar with. You know, I, I can imagine that there was a high degree of familiarity here. And the thesis on both players is expend very little in the way of resources to grab them. Uh, you know, have that permanent option if you think that they're going to come good. And the reason that either one might come good is basically changes of scenery might be helpful for either one. And we'll get to Akinola a little bit deeper in a second. But for Hoppy, he's been bouncing around a bunch of different clubs. He hasn't gotten a really strong run of games anywhere. He needs somewhere to kind of settle in. Uh, and he's getting to move back to his native California in order to do so. So, you know, they're basically lottery tickets each. Uh, and if they can help with the depth for the next six months, they, you know, that's great. You know, but then there's that long term potential is really where the, the transactions either going to rise or fall. And, and there's something else here, Colin, that I want to address, because I think and I, I've, I've mentioned this a little bit, I think that this signing has has bigger implications. I think that this signing isn't just about reducing it to the spreadsheet, reducing it to his numbers and thinking, you know, what is he adding? How many goals is he bringing? I think that this is the kind of signing that can change the narrative of San Jose's season, that can motivate the players around him, that can motivate the locker room, that can bring fans to the stadium, and that can can give them the push they need to get into the playoffs. Because look, these players are humans before they are numbers, before you can reduce them to the, the XG and their you know finishing percentages. They're humans who respond to the, 
the motivation, to the, you know, the trials of being a professional soccer player and to the environment that's around them. And I think that regardless of who it is, making a high profile signing at this stage in the season is an investment in the team. It's telling the players we are investing in this team right now. We believe that this is a team that can go and make the playoffs and make a run in the playoffs. And we are going to put our money where our mouth is. And we're going to make that happen because we trust you guys and we're investing in this team right now. That's not something that San Jose has done for as long as I've been covering the team. I don't think we've ever had a summer signing who has made an immediate impact, who has been high profile, who will motivate the players to go and make the playoffs that season. And we've seen them time after time struggle in the second half of the season, tail off, look unmotivated, uh, and and then wimp, you know, whimper, yep. limp towards the end of the season. And this signing is, I think, going to prevent them from doing that. I think it has a knock-on effect Jim. on the, the rest of this locker room. Jim Moore, I'll give you the last word on this, and we're going to move on actually to the rest of it because you know Akash has this question here, but I and wanted I to you, kind of close this topic answer. before we get that. Yeah. Okay, so just so we know, we're going to come back to that. So Akash will get that answered for you. So the answer is, for, according to Alex, Alex's comments, I can see a world in which that is true. Um, and it might even be this world. I'm not going to say it's not true. Um, he certainly has a certain energy about him that might be able to help the rest of the team. It's also equally possible that he's going to get immediately tuned out if he brings those kind of antics, you know, into the locker room and, and onto the practice pitch and the other players don't appreciate it. They're going to go like, so what this kid was an American, you know, Academy kid that happened to get hot for a couple of weeks in Europe. And now he's, you know, supposed to be better than us. I, I, I think some players might take exception to that. Um, I, I could, you know, and does that motivate a Benji to step up? Maybe it might just piss Benji off, um, to be quite honest, uh, that, 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 uh, they even brought him in. So, you know, uh, he's the one player I think that could get motivated out of this. And I don't know if it's going to go in the positive direction. Um, I don't think it lights a fire under Cade Cowell. I think it's going to be very easy to tell that, that, you know, th that he's not really going to be someone to challenge Cade Cowell, Cade Cowell's role right now. Um, what could be interesting is to see like when Jack Skane's healthy, uh, kind of, you know, what, what that is, because I saw Skane as a potential option to be able to start starting on the left wing, you know, once Montero was back and really kind of push Cade, you know, for that starting position. Um, I could see, I could see that. Um, but I, you know, who is he, who's he pushing here? I just, I just don't see who he's pushing. He's, I don't think he's pushing Jibo. I don't think he's pushing Cade. Uh, maybe he pushes Benji. That would be great if Benji all of a sudden performs, but now you're picking, are you putting on Hoppy? Or are you putting on Benji? Like, what do you actually accomplish out of that? I don't, I don't think it has to be a push. I don't, I don't think that the only way that a new signing can motivate a team is by challenging somebody's starting spot. I think that's probably true in some cases, but I think that the guys around him, I think that the Christian Espinosas, the midfielders, the defense will recognize the value of this signing and the, 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 you know, the sign of trust that it shows from the front office and the, the motivation that it brings the team. And that will pull them forward. That will propel them forward as a team. I, I, I don't want to underestimate that value because if we remember back to the last few games before League's Cup, we were entering the meh part of the season. The players looked tired. They looked unmotivated. They looked like they'd run out of ideas. Let me tell you, uh, this signing, Matthew Hoppy will give this team new ideas. It will give them new directions. It will give them new opportunities. It will catalyze uh, change within this team. And I think that is good. Can I say one, one thing just about a football monkeys comment about the cap hit for, you know, being small, does that mean where the, you know, is the club putting the money where the mouth is? Uh, just to clarify that $75,000 on cap hit is actually true of both Iacanola and uh, uh, Matthew Hoppy. The, out of pocket from the ownership hit for Hoppy is probably 250 grand for uh, Ayakanola is probably 350 grand. So the, the out of pocket hit from the ownership is actually a, a quite a bit larger because the only parts of the roster where the cap hit and the ownership hit are kind of different are the DP slots and the U22 slots. So I do think this actually does send a certain amount of ambition that 
John Fisher was willing to authorize, you know, more than a half a million dollars of spending uh, into a very narrow cap window um, because, you know, given these U22 programs. So I think there is a level of ambition. And of course, there's a level of pedigree, too, when you have a guy who, you know, has scored in the Bundesliga, who's, you know, got eight national team caps. Same thing with Iowa Canola, by the way, you know, plays for Canada. He got that USMNT cap. You know, he had a hot run as well. Like those are guys that, you know, people are on the practice pitch are going to say, oh, they've, you know, they've, you know, those are real guys. They have real pedigree to go to. Um, but anyway, I just want to say the ambition factor there, I think, is relevant specifically to the, the transaction structure. Uh, Jamin, I'll give you the last comment then on this debate. I'll rule on it and we'll move on. I'm done. I'm right. done. I'll take we, another we, we, we promised. No, no, we promised. <laughs> yeah, we, pro we promised the fans some fireworks. I think we delivered on good. the fireworks. But I think there's some good questions here and other well, things yeah, we should well, get into. Before we get that so. up, my, my ruling here is that, like, uh, Jamin, I, I'm with you that I don't think that – I think it's unlikely that Hoppy displaces anybody yeah. in the starting lineup, and I think it's probably less than 50% likelihood that he becomes a long-term player for the Quakes. However, the, and the same thing, by the way, I would say, roughly speaking about Akinola, I have a little bit more faith in Akinola just given his particular skill set. Um, However, the fact that they were able to slip this transaction into the cap structure that they had, given the limitations they had and the potential upside, I'm fine with the fact that he might not be a starting level guy. I think it's actually a brilliant transaction kind of on the on the, that basis alone. Um, so I think that for me, I was very skeptical of the idea of bringing him in for three million dollars and, you know, competing uh, in that way. That was a valuation that didn't make any sense to me. This this makes quite a lot of sense, and, and it gives them six months to decide whether either of these lottery tickets are winners. So, you know, to that extent, you each have won. Um, and so, so well done to you both. Um, the, the, fans, now, the fans are the true winners tonight. The fans are the true winners tonight. The fans tonight. are the so true now, winners when Matthew Hoppy scores a hat trick debut. Is what I mean. Look, I, uh, we'd all, uh, Jamin and I'm I certainly would love, gonna, I'm certainly going to eat crow, and it'll yeah, be a Jamin lot of Yeah, Jamin and I, I would happens. love to be wrong about his overall skill set. I mean, you know, finishing, finishing can be fickle, but it is a real thing to a certain extent. Uh, and if he has that, it could happen. Again, um, I think it's anyway. important to say, I'm not rooting against the guy. No, no, God, God, for no, the guy. none of us are. We want, um, we want to see him succeed. We want to see this, this be entertaining. We want to see the Quakes push for the playoffs. So, so now let's let's turn the page to uh, a broader view to basically what could happen the rest of this season in the transfer market. I know you've all heard that the transfer window was closed, and that is true to a certain extent. But I want to talk a little bit about what could still happen. Uh, and this question from Akash is actually uh, somewhat related to that, which is could they have bought down one of the DPs and signed another one? So currently on the website, they have listed three DPs. I think that at least one of them is is within the range to be tammed down and they have the ability to open up that slot. That does not mean that they have the ability to fit because a designated player has the slot, the DP slot, but then they also take a what they call a maximum cap charge on the hard cap itself. Freeing up the slot, absolutely. There is at least one and potentially two of the DPs that could be done quite easily. I, I can't say too much more about what I know about that, but that is very possible. Uh, the on cap dollars would be really hard uh, to create the space for. Uh, so I don't think it would be very easy for the club to do another DP without moving somebody out at this point. Um, but it would be very, e it would be very possible for them to get that third DP tag for the remainder of the season. It would be very difficult to keep those three guys on the roster, have no one else move out and squeeze somebody else in. That would be very difficult. Uh, uh, this next coming off season, we have a different problem, which is that Christopher Espinosa has signed a, a new extension where the extension announcement specifically says he'll be a designated player for the next couple of years, which is a sign that he's above the TAM we, threshold. And we got, and we got a confirmation from Chris Leach. He is not going to be tamable. And, oh, okay. Uh, he, All right. he is, he is got, getting a race. All right. I had heard that privately. I didn't realize that we had that out. In the we, report we finally, the we finally got some more public. Okay. Yeah, Very good. Uh, and then, and Groezo, uh, unless they have played with the cap rules in a way that I don't understand, his transfer fee will also make it very difficult for him to, you know, to tam down. So uh, the the th third slot really would be Jamiro Montero at that point, and the club will have to make a decision about him then. But this rest of this window, they can get the tag, but they can't necessarily get the space without a movement out. With the movement out, this is the and other just thing. Just to be just to be clear, so that every you know that that because uh, even I want to make sure I'm I'm clear on it, Colin. So I'm sure the fans do too. It's because of the amount of GAM that they have available that would be necessary to buy a player down to be able to bring in another designated player. You believe the amount of GAM left is not sufficient 
to create that kind of space. Is that fair? Yeah. So the, the tag itself they could do, um, but they couldn't buy it down far enough to create enough on cap space to facilitate another DP coming in, uh, basically. Yeah. Uh, and that's just the important thing is you have three DP slots, but the, each one of those slots comes with $612,500 each on the cap. So you actually kind of need to have space for both. And I think they have space for the tag, but you know, they can't get all the way down to create enough space for that full cap hit. Um, and, and, and yes, uh, my impression is they're very tight up against allocation money right now, and they would need a movement out to do so. This is the important part, though. This is the part that Jamin and I were texting back and forth about this earlier, so I wanted to kind of clarify this. The international transfer window for MLS has closed. Uh, so that means that you can't register new players in MLS for the rest of the season uh, that are you know transfers in. There's two things to keep in mind, however. One is you can absolutely transfer players out to any league that has its transfer window still open. So England, Spain, you know, whatever, all those windows are still open. If they want to acquire Cade Cowell, they can still do so and register him in their own leagues, you know, at, up until their transfer deadline. Uh, so that means that the outgoings are not limited at this point. And then secondarily, the incomings uh, are still allowed when they're free agents. Uh, and I think the domestic transfers as well. Uh, if, uh, so anyway, there, there, there is still some potentiality for movement here. Um, I, I'm just think that given how constrained they are in the resources, it's unlikely unless you have a big European club come with a big offer uh, for Cade Cal brings in a lot of gam and all of a sudden creates a lot of space for them to make some extra moves. Uh, but the point is that the, these windows are still open, so it's not necessarily a closed book. Uh, and so Alex, if you, I don't know if you had something on that. Well, I, 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 I appreciate that explanation, Colin, you know, the MLS roster mechanism is better than than anyone else I know. And we are so glad to have you here uh, to, to help set us straight. But I don't think the Quakes need anybody else at this point in the season. After these two additions, I'm happy with the way that the roster looks. And unless for some reason, some European club football director panics and hits a $5 million check on Cade Cowell, I don't think the earthquakes need to be looking for any swap at this stage in the season. The thing that we were lacking going into this transfer window was offensive options and offensive depth. And they have that now. And I think that they're a well-rounded, well-balanced team going into the second half of this season. I think that they've done exactly what they needed to do in this summer transfer window. And I'm satisfied. That's the first time that's happened in a long time. I've, I, I, I've never seen the earthquakes you know, set themselves up for success and then deliver in the summer transfer window. And I think they've done that now. And the way I see it, I think that the, 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 the window's done and the books are closed. Well, so I was, it, I was much happier with last transfer window, much, much happier, significantly because you got Gruesa, you got Trauco, you got Rodriguez. You set yourself up to be able to slice 20 something goals off of last season on those three signings alone Daniel. for this season. Well, they didn't get Daniel until the offseason, but I'm just talking about secondary window oh, last the secondary year. Secondary window, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And yep. and also the the free agent signing, which Trauco was a free agent, he wasn't in the window, right? So I think like you know the first two were good, particularly a Capo. I think was a disappointment because he was injured, wasn't going to be able to play for a while. I think when once they added Trauco, using that additional time that Colin just talked about, I think that made the last window a success. What that tells me is that I'm not saying this window is a failure, but I don't think the Quakes got what they needed to out of the window because ultimately you didn't, you didn't yet move Cade to bring in the money that you may need to do a bigger type of move, which means that because you couldn't move Cade, you didn't yet replace him at left wing and bring in the player that we've been talking about on the left wing. You didn't bring in a potential 10 um, although maybe you've got one now in Jack Skane, um, based on what we've seen, if he's health, if he gets back uh, to being healthy again and doesn't have a doesn't have any issues with his hamstring, um, and uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, Asher Cohn in particular has been saying, you've got a problem at the six if Cruzzo goes down, and now we know that's a bigger problem because Judson's going to be out for like at least six weeks, according to the press release yesterday. So they're very, very thin at defensive midfielder. I think there's a lot of concerns for this team still in terms of, of setting themselves up for for not just for next year, but for the stretch playoff. Damon, well, first of all, I think these are two different transfer windows. I think 
The, well, of course, this Remember Quakes team, year, this Quakes team is much more well-rounded and set up for future success than last season. Than last season, I think was more of a space they were in anticipating a new coach the next year, trying to set themselves up for long-term success. And that's why you saw the Acapo deal and the Trauco deal at the end of the transfer window. They were not guys who made an impact at all that season. Even Rodriguez, who you said, you know, cut 20 goals off, he played seven games and he really wasn't fit uh, enough to make an immediate impact. This transfer window they need short-term impact, somebody who will boost them immediately, and that's what they've gone and gotten. Carlos Grosso, by the way, was an off-season signing, so you can't credit that to last summer. So I, I, I think that two different transfer windows, last season they did a good job of preparing themselves, paving the way for Luchi Gonzalez, and this season I think they've done a great job of adding offensive talent and making this team better for the rest of the season and propelling them into the playoffs. And I think Chris Leach deserves credit for both transfer windows, and I think that he's done – a great job setting up this roster for success under Luigi Gonzalez. I think both transfer windows point to Chris Leach having a good long-term plan and executing on that long-term plan. So if I miss, gonna, if I misspoke and said Garezo, I meant Trauco. Sorry about that. Trauco enough. didn't play again though last season. Again, setting himself up for this year. Um, so, yeah. so I, I just in in my role as judge, I'm going to do the exact same thing I did on the last topic, which is take a portion of what each of you said and agree with it. So for Alex, I, I, uh, kind of I agree fundamentally that you know the 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 transfer window that was last summer is not comparable to the transfer window of this summer. It was actually a fundamentally different challenge that Chris Leach faced uh, when you're going for you know building a team from nothing. You know where adding talent anywhere makes the team better, not having to get results in the short term. You know being able to play for the long term. That's a very different challenge than a mostly solidified team that needs a little bit extra to kind of get over the top. And it needs that extra to happen right now as they're chasing the playoffs. So I do think it's a fundamentally different challenge. And so it's not really an app, apples to apples uh, comparison. On the other side, Jamin, I completely agree with you. I think that there are some serious regrets in this transfer window. One of them is you weren't able to sell Cade Cowell. And the other is, you know, Alex, you know, I disagree with you here. They need a creative attacking midfielder to pair, you know, somebody more like Christian Espinosa on the left side. Matthew Hoppe, if he scores a little bit of uh, goals from the left, you know, maybe that's helpful. But not only do I think this, uh, the club thinks this. The club wants to get a big DP left wing or a 10 or somebody who's going to be a real creator type. You know, the guy, their equivalent of Zellerion or, you know, Nico Ladero or whatever. Obviously, Christian Espinosa has been wonderful on the one side. But, you know, if they can get something similar from the other side, that's their top priority. And they couldn't find that in this window and they couldn't fit it in, uh, which, as I said, probably would have taken an exit to make it happen. So, you know, it is a different challenge than they faced last summer. But I do think they came up short on their goals. I, I do want to say they did re-sign Christian Espinosa to a new long-term deal and also extended Rodriguez's contact. So those are two other pieces of business that did happen this summer. Both of, both, both of which are really solid deals, really good deals. So I think you can, you know, marginally improve your your transfer rating uh, no, absolutely. for Look, those deals. This, I think that marginal improvement uh, may sound like an insult or damning with faint praise, but I do think that there was marginal improvement in this window, and I think it happened on a lot of, a lot of little levels. The Espinosa contract is a big deal. If that hadn't happened, we would be talking all about that and how big of a disaster the Quakes are walking yes, into. 100%. Uh, Rodriguez, that was uh, you know uh, uh, that was triggering a, a contract extension. I think it was a no brainer uh, at a certain point, and actually kind of gives credit to their original deal structure from the beginning that allowed them so much time to make the decision, uh, you know, to to basically take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, this window they they plugged a couple holes, and they were very smart in their use of limited resources. You know, they hit a bunch of singles in terms of the ins and the outs, and then they did a really good job with the Krishnos extension. But those two big looming things, and we've been talking about since the beginning of this year uh is you know what is happening at the left wing position you got to get more productivity from there hasn't happened yet with any of the guys on the roster and they haven't been able to add anybody to poppy who again not truly a left winger and you know we have some mixed opinion about how good he's going to be and then the sale of of those assets benji kikanovic certainly had a rumored bid they didn't take it he's been terrible this season you know uh kate cowell they haven't gotten a large bid yet uh or anything attractive you know so they're big Big picture stuff, those are all still sitting out there. They may eventually come resolved in the next offseason. And hey, 
we might get surprised at the end of August as well if one of the European clubs turns around and tries to get uh, one of them as well. I, I do think that it is a, a little different situation than, than going into this season because you now have Jack Skane who's lighting up Major League Soccer and who can provide some of those attributes in the number 10 role that I think that I was hoping for from the transfer window. I was expecting that the team would have to, you know, go sign a guy like Lucas Del Ryan to get any of those attributes in the midfield. I think we've seen a lot of that from Jack Skane in the last two months. And so that is part of the reason why I'm satisfied with the additions that they've made. And yeah, sure. You know, getting a, a, a you know, big seven figure transfer for Cade would have been nice, but that can still happen in future transfer windows. I want to back up real quick to the Espinoza uh, situation. And, and by the way, just for those chatting about it, Tecatito was a fake thing and could have been completely ignored. It was posted, posted basically by a fake rumor account. Um, so, uh, so look, Colin's absolutely right. Had, had the Christian Espinoza deal not gotten done in this window when it did, we would have been, that would have been pushed into the off season. As soon as the offseason hit, the number one question that we would be asking every single week to anyone you know, in the club who would listen to us is, what's going on with Christian Espinoza? What's going on with Christian Espinoza? What's going on with Christian Espinoza? So the number one thing that this club could have done, the best thing this club could have done, is re-sign Christian Espinoza before bringing in any new player. Because any new player you bring in is a, is a, is a risk and an unknown quantity to some level of how they're going to fit into the club. You know what Christian Espinoza brings. There is no doubt about that. And, and giving him a raise, you know, then some, some credit needs to go, you know, to the club because that's additional investment, by the way. That is not just, oh, you know, Fisher gave him the money he was already giving. No, no, no. You know, there's, there's good information here that says this deal is pushed north toward the $2 million mark. And we don't know exactly what the numbers are, but it's credible that it's gone that direction, particularly when you know he's not tameable. And there's no transfer fee this time. So it's not even like you have to amortize the transfer fee over a three-year deal anymore, Colin. Now his salary is high enough to push him out of the tan range just on salary alone. Forget the amortization part. Yeah, it's, a, it's of, at least one eight. Fee. It might be a touch higher than that. Yeah, so I'm guessing it's it's closer closer to two million. We'll find out when MLSPA releases this next number. So I do want to give. But we actually to won't find out until next spring because that's when the. Ex, the oh, is that when we see the next one? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but, but, you know, all that, all that being said, you know, kudos to Leach, kudos to the front office and even kudos to John Fisher for, um, you know, making sure that you wrapped up Christian Espinoza and taking the number one question off the yep. table at the end of the season. Other questions you're going to have Rodriguez. Okay. Nathan, Nathan, you know, we think like, uh, you know, his deal is, is running out. So Rodriguez and Nathan plus now what's going on, you know, you know, with your other center back Mensa, you know, the only sure thing that you have out there is Tanner Beeson coming into next season. So I, there are going to be some huge question marks. They potentially could have taken care of in this window, you know, and, and did not getting Rodriguez at least through the end of the season is the question that they had to answer right now. Yeah. And, and by the way, they have a, they have a contractual option on him. So it's not like they needed to make a decision on the buy. Correct. Uh, right about now. So I think that they're relatively yeah. settled that. But and you didn't point. want to trigger that. You didn't want to trigger. Let me just finish my, off that thought because you didn't want to trigger that because what happened, what, you know, if he ends up in some, you know, God forbid season ending injury situation or something like that, now you've triggered that option and he might not be available next yeah, year. There's no reason to trigger those kinds of options that until you have to. The day really. you have to. Yeah. And, and you can tell him like, Hey, we intend to trigger, you know, to keep him happy, but there's really Correct. no, the club that does not benefit by, early triggering, by, triggering um, by early triggering by the way so yeah next offseason you alluded to it you know uh, mensa probably comes off the books nathan may come off the books he's coming off this serious injury you know jamiro montero has an option year they may decline it there there's definitely space to be created there but the number one creator of space that we're all waiting for of course is that big sale which leads to a million dollars in gam uh, and that just creates a whole we got all of kinds of spots for him saudi arabia netherlands yep. france sold him to rhymes yeah <laughs> Um, all right. Anyway, boys, uh, we are getting close to an hour here. I know we have to wrap up. Obviously, the feature set of the debate, I think it went great. You did both uh, really well. I say that as, as some level of authority. But is there anything else you'd like to add about the transfer window that's happened or the things that are coming up uh, for the rest of the season as we go on this long break uh, without much soccer from the San Jose Earthquakes? Uh, Jamin, I'll start with you, actually. 
You know, I, I think Alex asked a really good good question. Unfortunately, Alex, your uh, it didn't your question didn't come through, but I think I understood your question from Lucci's response after the League's Cup game. You know, what I did see from them in a two striker formation was actually quite interesting. It's not Lucci's go to. He's very much a four three three guy. I think everyone knows that he's played some four two three one. You know, uh, this season more recently as well. Um, but it was interesting. And now that you've gotten two more strikers in. In in Io, uh, you know, and 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 uh, now now today with um, oh, the name just went on my head. Matthew. The reason Hoppy. we're all here, Matthew Hoppy. Thank you. The reason we're all here, um, but but with uh, with you know two new strikers in, like it, it almost feels like you need to play with this formation a bit more. You need to give a little bit more thought to how can you get two strikers on. I think oh, that's a nice a, guy to to as a complimentary striker where you can combine and hold the ball up and and you can imagine him being a good pair. Right. And and you still have Benji and you and you uh and you still have other talent, you know, that can that can also make that type of formation work. So I think it would be really interesting to see more experimentation around that as the team goes forward. Um they're gonna be getting into a situation where they're gonna need to get points, they're gonna need to get wins. I estimate at least three wins at this point to get into a playoff spot, as many as five to get into a sure seventh or higher playoff spot. So I think it's going to be really important for the team to get into situations where they might accept a draw, but instead they need to kind of start pushing, you know, for the chance at three points and having additional strikers is definitely helpful for that type of thing. And I also want to see, you know, more of that two striker uh, format in order to be able to push them in. So overall, that might be able to help get them there, getting in a vibes guy. We'll see. We'll see if it brings the energy Alex is saying. You know, I'm interested and, you know, I'm happy to crow in this one if I'm off base. It's just the history doesn't give me a lot of hope. Alex Morgan, final thoughts before we sign off. I agree in that I'm really, really excited in the way that this signing could change the uh, the way that this offense looks. I think that he will give this offense a new look. He will give them new options that could unlock combinations, patterns, options for Luchi Gonzalez that we haven't seen before, especially the two striker look. I think that will allow them to press teams in an interesting new way, allow them to counter against teams in an interesting new way. And I think that Matthew Hoppy is a good guy to put up there because he can make diagonal runs in behind and you can finish those chances. And those are two attributes that the Quakes really need because they don't have a player on the roster right now who has been doing that consistently. I think, I think there's uh, the most comparable player is Benji Gukanovic. And my hope is that by bringing in Matthew Hoppy, you can create that role for Benji Gukanovic. You can get Benji Gukanovic also to have some minutes in that number nine role because he's truly a number nine and you can motivate him at that position. So I think that, I, I think that Matthew Hoppy is the exact kind of player that I would have wanted. He's adding to this offense without a significant cap hit, no long-term risk or commitment that this team is making. He's fantastic vibes. He might get some Watkey videos to be made about the San Jose earthquakes. It, at very least, if that's all we come away with, I think that's a win for this team. That will make me happy. That will make fans happy. Uh, so all around, I think this is a, uh, the perfect signing for this moment. And I think that uh, we have to give Chris Leach credit for for pulling off a, a kind of miraculous deal uh, in the you know the, the very last second of the transfer window here. All right, thanks to you both uh, for this. I'm excited. It's an exciting signing. I hope to the fans who have been following uh, that this is exactly what you tuned in for. Uh, if this is exactly what you tuned in for, you got to like, subscribe, and then of course notify here on YouTube. But more importantly, sign up for our Patreon. The link is up there on the video right now. Um, we have different levels for either early access and articles. You can get into our uh, Slack, which is a good you know community to be a part of and discuss things like that. Which was pretty wild of, today, by the way. Yeah, I was I was working today, so I missed most of it. But it, you know, these are the, these are the reasons that you sign up for the Quicks Up Center Slack. Uh, we really appreciate all your support. Thanks so much. It will be a little while before the Quicks play a game of soccer again, but we will be there for you when you get back. Take care, guys. <laughs>